What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Action Network podcast presented by BetMGM. I'm your host, Chris Raybon of the Action Network. And on today's pod, we're doing our draft grades. We'll do our NFC edition here. And joining me to break it all down, a longtime friend of the podcast, Matthew Friedman of Fantasy Life. Matt, how's it going? Uh, it's good. By the way, I'm not just a longtime friend. I'm an ex-girlfriend. Okay. <laughs> hey, man, I was I was trying to give you the the more positive thing. You know, X that has some negative connotations there. You know, I thought we broke up on uh, on good terms. So we did. It was an amicable <laughs> parting, and uh, happy to be back on the show. And we did we did the show last year, and uh-huh. uh, I believe in passing. I mentioned something about hey, Puka Nakua might be decent. So I'm going to give myself full credit. Uh, and that I definitely could see that he was going to be an all pro. Yes. And that that's why we have you here. And that's, that's why we want to get your uh, breakdowns of all these teams. We'll get your, get a grade out of you for each, each, uh, each team. And uh, before we kind of dive in, we'll go team by team, of course, but um, I just wanted to get kind of your big picture takeaways from the uh, 2024 NFL draft uh, in general uh, and your biggest surprise uh, from the NFC in particular. Yeah, so it was pretty chalky overall. Like if you were someone who avidly read a whole bunch of mock drafts, what you saw in there was pretty representative of what you ended up seeing in round one, with the exception, of course, of Bo Nix and Michael Penix going in round one uh, and going as early as they did. You know, some people thought maybe the Broncos would trade back uh, and they'd pick up Bo Nix near the end of round one. Some people thought, you know, Penix 13 to the Raiders. uh, But no, the Falcons uh, jumped the gun. And then Sean Payton just wanting to get his guy jumped the gun at number 12. And so, you know, the story was the quarterbacks. And I will say, I was very skeptical. We would see five or six quarterbacks go in round one. And here's one of the biggest reasons why. At no point in this process did anyone say, this is maybe the greatest quarterback prospect class of all time. No one even came close to saying something like that. They said that, uh, you know, three years ago, when we had five guys go in round one, no one said anything like that now, but we had six quarterbacks go not just in round one, but in the top 12. And that ties the all time mark for quarterbacks in round one set by the all time great 1983 quarterback class. Like the NFL is valuing these guys as if this is an all time great class and, you know, time will tell, but I, I believe right now, Penix was a reach and Bo Nix was a reach. Yeah. I mean, we've been, you know, we've done pre-draft pods in the past where we're, you know, looking for betting angles. And one of the things we usually do is kind of take the under on amount of quarterbacks drafted in the first round. So uh, yeah, this is definitely a a surprise, especially for them all to go yet yeah, within the top, you know, top half of that draft. Uh, let's start with the Atlanta Falcons. Let's start in the NFC South, just so we can talk about the Atlanta Falcons first, because I'm curious as to your opinion uh, you know, on on Penix and, the, and then the rest of the draft, you know, I'll, I'll just tell you what I thought, you know, from a player perspective, I, I don't like to knock a team too much because I think it's hard to evaluate these guys. There's a range of outcomes. You know, Penix could be a, a decent quarterback. He, he may not be. Um, but what bothered me about the, the pick was then, you know, hearing just the GM and, and, and kind of the justification for it and, and it just didn't seem like it was well thought out. It didn't seem like he understands that, you know, there's a big edge to having a, a quarterback on a rookie deal and kind of sitting one is not necessarily, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really tie into what you did with the, the money you gave Kirk Cousins and whatnot. But uh, what were your thoughts on, on this whole panic situation? Yeah, I, I think you, you said it right there. The, the thing that gets me, and I'll just actually start with this. Uh, I agree with you on the idea that it's really hard to evaluate, oh, you should have taken this quarterback versus that quarterback. Like you can do that within a a general range if it's like, hey, on consensus boards, these guys were separated by 30 picks. Like Mm -hmm. you probably made a mistake, but if quarterbacks are in the same general range, it's really hard to be able to say, oh, you obviously made a mistake. I think what we evaluate thinking about how these teams did, the grades that we should give them, we're focused more on the process. Like what are the things that you could control? Did you give us, it's like poker, like you can't control how the cards come out. What you can control is how you're betting. Are you giving yourself a chance to have a winning hand? And when you have a winning hand, are you giving yourself a chance to win big? 
And that's the way of thinking about this. The Falcons are kind of trying to have their cake and eat it too. And I think it's going to just be a disgusting cake. Um, if you want Michael Penix in the top 10, that's fine. But then you don't give Kirk Cousins $100 million guaranteed. If you want Cousins because you want to compete right now, that's fine. But then commit to that. And with the number eight pick, give him a weapon or give your defense a weapon. Like lean into the idea that we got Cousins now because we are ready to compete and we're going all in this direction. What they're trying to do is, you know, build for the future, which like long term, fine, that makes sense. But if you're doing that, it does not make sense to have Kirk Cousins on a $100 million contract. And that's like the strategy part of it. And then I'd also say like, there's the tactics part of it where if you knew you were going to go this way, you probably want to handle it in a different way than what you did. You don't want to start by alienating your quarterback who hasn't even played a game for you yet. Yeah. And by the way, that's the guy who is going to have to be in the same quarterback room as the guy that you want to be the long-term franchise quarterback. Like now you've created a situation where the guy who theoretically like should be mentored up, like is not going to have a very willing mentor, you know? So all of that is bad. And then that's just the first round. In the second round, I think they made a really obvious mistake by trading up for defensive tackle Rook Aroro instead of just taking uh, Johnny Newton, who was on the board right there and who was, you know, thought of as a round one guy. So not only did you screw up the first round, I think you also screwed up the second round and just gave away a ton of value. So uh, for the Falcons, I mean, I don't want to be like, hey, this is an F, but if if I'm giving an F in this class, this is the team that's getting the F. Uh, screw it. I'm giving them an F. Yeah, I mean, I it's just funny because this Falcon team, like let's think back th three, four years of their draft. They've taken a skill, an offensive skill player in the top 10 in each of the last four drafts. And I don't know exactly what they have to show for it. I mean, they're especially like th their offense should be elite by now, the way they're drafting skill players in the in the top half of the first round. And I mean, one guy might might sit for a few years. The other guy was just OK last year. A couple of them are just OK. So it's yeah, it's 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 going to be an interesting season for the Falcons. But uh, they they're. They better have hit on some of these other picks. I'll say that because, you know, with the with the money they gave Cousins, uh, they they need to be winning now. Yeah. All right, let's go to the team that won the division, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, you know, what did you think of what Tampa Bay did in this draft? Yeah, I mean, it felt like um, solid. I don't really have much to say in terms of, oh, you did this thing really well or you did this thing poorly. It was just like an all around, I'll say like, you know, a C plus, you know, or uh, B minus. I'll give them a B minus. There was nothing bad. I did like that they took uh, Graham Barton, uh, a versatile offensive lineman out of Duke in the first round. Uh, a good chance that he plays center, but you know, he's played left tackle. Like he could, there's a chance he could play tackle in the NFL in a pinch. Uh, he could probably be a really good guard. Maybe he could be a top tier center. So I like that they got a guy who addresses a position of need. Uh, they got him at some value in the first round, fell down the board a little bit, and he has great positional versatility. And then in the third round, uh, Jalen McMillan, uh, some people thought that he was actually bang for buck, maybe like the best out of the three wide receivers out of Washington. Like, I don't really have that opinion, but I think he was a good player uh, and he slots into uh, the slot. Uh, and I, I think he could give them some explosiveness in the middle of the field. So uh, I like that pick as well. Uh, Bucky Irving running back that they got in the fourth round. I think he's fine. A, a pass catching option and and gives uh, gives them some more. Um, I would say like versatility, but like he's able to replicate what they're getting out of their starter now so that if he's injured, then Bucky Irving can come in and I think they don't really lose much. So I think it was a solid draft, nothing exceptional, but nothing wrong. Uh, the New Orleans Saints, they only had a, a couple picks, you know, in that top in, in those top, you know, five rounds or so. They don't have anything in three and four, but they do take uh, Kool-Aid. Uh, at the corner early in round two. And they also take Spencer Rattler uh, in the middle of round five. Thoughts on the Saints draft? Yeah, it's again like one of those drafts where um, it was really obvious what they were very likely to do in the first round. Like they just need 
offensive line help. Uh, you know, Ryan Ramchick, uh, it seems like he's unlikely to continue his career, or at least it, it's uncertain with the knee injury. Trevor Penning at left tackle really hasn't panned out. Uh, they lost, you know, both of their kind of tackle slash guard uh, guys uh, this offseason. It's just like they needed help. And uh, Fuaga, uh, I think, is a guy who could, you know, come in right away, play right tackle, play left tackle. They can kick him inside if needed. Um, I think they got him at a little a little bit of value. Like there was some possibility that he could have gone off the board at 10 to the jets, for instance. So I think getting at him at 14, there's some value there. Uh, yeah. I like adding uh Kool-Aid McKinstry. Um, you know, they need some help in the secondary and then Spencer Rattler uh, in the fifth round. I, I think like he's, he's an intriguing flyer, like a developmental guy, um, you know, in a different universe, he could have been Caleb Williams, you know, like if things had just worked out a little bit differently, he could have been that guy. Uh, and I think getting him in the fifth round, seeing if you can develop him a little bit behind Derek Carr, like, uh, unlike, unlike the Falcons who are doing that with the number eight pick, like doing it with the 150th pick, like, I feel like that makes sense here. So I think it's, it's a decent draft. I'm going to say like, a, a mm, yeah, like a, a C plus. Um, like I would have liked to have had them get more picks, you know, in, in rounds three and four, but you know, they couldn't do that just based on the way they worked the board previously. But, uh, yeah, this is a, a fine draft. There's nothing obviously wrong with it. Yeah. The Saints tend to hit on, I would say more of their picks than the average team. So, I mean, it would have been nice if they had them, but I wouldn't be surprised if somebody pops that we're not even expecting or pops more than, than we were expecting from this class for the Saints, uh, Carolina, I mean, yeah, I last year draft didn't really go too great. Now uh, this year they they trade up for Xavier Leggett in, in the first round of wide out. Uh, they go running back at forty uh, six with Jonathan Brooks out of Texas. Uh, they do get uh, Jatavian Sanders also out of Texas uh, later in the draft as well at tight end, which was a need for them. What do you think of Carolina's draft? Yeah, I kind of low key hated this draft. Um, like, I, I think they did a decent job this offseason of bringing in offensive guards, bringing in Deontay Johnson, trying to solidify your offense around your second year quarterback who you took number one overall last year. And I think in the draft, you see them trying to continue that trend, as you mentioned, bringing in uh, Leggett, bringing in Jonathan Brooks, uh, Jatavian Sanders. So like you're building around your quarterback, you're trying to give him pieces. But the thing is, like they traded up for Xavier Leggett. Like they didn't need to trade up from 33 to 32 to get him. And uh, honestly, like Leggett, there are like legit concerns, like with his profile, like he didn't break out until his final season and uh, stylistically, like as a prospect, he was super similar to Jonathan Mingo. It's like, like I made the joke about like, why would you draft Leggett when you already have Jonathan Mingo, like AKA Mingo sucks, you know, but like, it's kind of like, that's the point. Like you overdrafted and you traded up to overdraft. And then, uh, you know, drafting a running back in the second round, probably not a, a great decision there. And then it's a guy who's coming off of an ACL tear and like, he will probably be fine. I think he should be a good player in the NFL, but you know, like you do not need a running back when you are in this kind of rebuild. And then Jatavian Sanders, I think he's fine as you know the top pick in the fourth round but i don't know he's not like that athletic um you have other tight ends already on the roster like he's just probably not going to move the needle so i don't know man like i at d plus like that's where i feel with this class yeah carolina they seem like it's they just can't get it right i mean there's been a lot of turnover in the you know among the coaching staff and i just i don't know if there's a clear vision yet as to what they're doing so yeah i wasn't a, I wasn't too big of a fan uh, of what carolina did either and I, I thought they had a few too many holes to really go running back uh that early in the draft even though I, the player I, i'm fine with but uh let's jump to the nfc north um let's start with chicago you know number one had the number one overall pick uh i like I liked what they did with, you know, going, they weren't scared to go wide receiver at nine with Romo Dunze, who I, you know, I think Chicago was kind of on that borderline where uh, I think they had, they done enough with their roster that they can afford to kind of give, give Caleb what he needs. And, and so I did like that pick. Uh, but what did you think of, of this bear draft? Yeah. Uh, absolutely loved it. 
And, um, you know, I liked that. I mean, so the choice at one, I feel like it's, it's kind of obvious, but you know, they didn't do anything to where there was like a lot of drama where there's like the risk of alienating your future quarterback. Like he knew they knew. And, you know, I think they should get some credit for the fact that last year they made, uh, a calculated and sharp decision in trading away the number one pick and, you know, rolling that into a future first. And that's how they got it this year. So I uh, like hat tip to them. Uh, they didn't have to earn the number one pick the old fashioned way. And what that means is that Caleb Williams is walking into, like, I don't think it's exaggerative to say this, probably the best situation that any like number one pick, especially the quarterback position has walked into, you know, he's got DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, and then Roma Dunze, who they picked at number nine. And like, it was not a guarantee that a Dunze was going to be there and, you know, hats mm -hmm. it to them for standing Pat, like not, uh, not trading up. Like, you know, they just, they got him, they let the board fall. And with those three guys, they have one of the best wide receiver trios in the league. You know, it, it might be a little bit fragile in that, you know, Keenan Allen is older, Adunze is a rookie, but a ton of upside. And then you add Cole Komet and Gerald Everett, two good pass catching tight ends, DeAndre Swift, a good pass catching running back. Like this offense has a chance to hum. Uh, so I really like that they did that. Uh, I also like, you know, the offensive tackle. Uh, that they added from Yale in the third round. Like, I know he's like a smaller school guy, but, you know, big, really long arms. Like, he could be a developmental guy. Uh, Tory Taylor, uh, punt god out of Iowa, uh, who, uh, you know, like, uh, Iowa punts a lot. That guy's had a ton of practice. Uh, you know, getting him in the fourth round, like, maybe that's a little bit of a reach, but, like, he could be a really good punter in the NFL. Like, I just, they didn't have many picks, but I feel like what they did with those picks was maximizing to their roster this year. So I don't know. Uh, a, a plus I'll give them an a plus. Let's talk uh, Detroit. You know, they were oh so close to going to the Super Bowl uh, this year. Um, you know, they do try to remake that secondary, which I think was, was, was smart. You know, they go Terry and Arnold out of Alabama in the first round. Uh, they go with the Miss Missouri corner uh, in late second. Uh, what do you think of Detroit's draft? So what I like is when um, front offices and general managers, they use the the free agency period and then the draft uh, in concert with each other. You know, like the complete opposite of, of what the Falcons did. But <laughs> I think we see that with the Lions here where they were hellbent on – fixing that secondary. And so uh, in free agency, they traded for Carlton Davis. They signed Amik Robertson. And then in the draft, yeah, they went, they got Terry and Arnold in the first round and they followed that up with Ennis Rakestraw in the second round. So like they have added four new cornerbacks to their room within the past three months, you know, and not, not all four of those guys are going to work out, but some of them probably will. And so I like that approach of like, hey, we are solid on offense. Let's fix our defense and finally be able to get some stops when we need it. So I do like the approach there. Uh, and they were able to get both of those guys at some value, especially Rake Straw in the second round. Uh, and one, you know, one thing, the note of value. Um, you know, when you look at consensus boards and then look at teams that reach, like that's a very clear signal that teams uh, probably have some bad process. And like it's borne out in the data where like those guys who are reaches tend to overperform when there are guys who are quote unquote steals like guys who fall down the board. The signal isn't nearly as strong because all of the NFL teams are passing on that guy and saying what they think of him. So like, I will say you can't always be like, Hey, this team got great value, but Hey, they, they did get at least the possibility of some value with these guys. They definitely didn't reach for them and they addressed a position of need while they were doing it. So like it's hitting that sweet spot of possible value and definite need here. So I do like what Detroit did and uh, I give them like an A minus. Yeah. And remember Detroit kind of, they, they went kind of more off the board last year's draft and people had a lot to say. And I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of worked out so far. So uh, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt there. Uh, Minnesota, they, they get their quarterback in McCarthy at 10. Uh, they get Dallas Turner uh, at, at 17. I think a lot of people thought he might go 
a, a little higher. And then they don't pick again until the fourth round. So uh, how do you, what do you, I guess the big question here, number one is just, what do you think of McCarthy? In, in, and then, you know, obviously the, the rest of the draft and the grade. Yeah, I like McCarthy in general. I think he's better than he probably got credit for based on what he didn't have to do in college. But, you know, when he was asked to throw on third and long, he did well. And he's a young guy. He was a top recruit. Um, you know, I I don't want to give like too much credit to like, you know, quarterback wins, but like the dude does <laughs> the dude does win. Like he doesn't like make mistakes that cost his team games, right? Like there is some value in that. Um, and then I'll just say, I do think it is a really good fit of player with circumstance. So he's got Justin Jefferson. He's got some other really good pass catchers there. I think he has a smart and supportive there. So I think, you know, out of any of the places where any of these quarterbacks could have landed, Minnesota was a great landing spot. Um, but I will say, uh, the Vikings didn't need to trade up to 10, like, great on them for not trading up to five for McCarthy, <laughs> but you know, they didn't need to trade up to 10. Like there was, there was a point in this draft where the Vikings kind of lost their cool just a little bit. They didn't need to trade up one spot to get JJ McCarthy. Um, and then they didn't need to trade up. You know, if, if you're thinking about like the pattern of trades, they didn't need to trade up from the second round into the first round and then the first round higher up into the first round to give up Dallas Turner. Like if you look at all of the picks that um, that the Vikings gave away to make that move, that ended up being like the equivalent of like the number five overall pick. And I'll say yeah. it's similar to what we saw out of the Texans last year where they had the number two pick, they got their quarterback, they traded up back into the number three pick and they took Will Anderson. Like, fine. It worked out for them. It probably wasn't all that great of a move even then. And maybe they got lucky, but even if you do think it was a good move, there is still a difference between that process and this process. Will Anderson was the clear number one edge in his class. Not the case for Dallas Turner, who ended up not being the number one edge in this class yeah. off the board. And Will Anderson was a stone cold lock in the top five. Definitely not the case for Dallas Turner, who fell to number 17. So I, I don't think like Turner is a bad player. I think it's actually like a good scheme fit that he has with the blind, uh, the Brian Flores system uh, in, in Minnesota. But I think they ended up moving more than they needed to, to get McCarthy and Turner. And that ended up costing them a lot of value in the middle rounds. So I like the players they got. I don't really like what they had to give up to get those guys. And so like, I do think of them as a little bit of a low key loser throughout this process. And I would say, uh, like C plus, like you got your quarterback, like that's always really important, but you had to give up a lot to get him. Yeah. And you know, it's one of those things where you're just really trusting your, the, like you're, you're not maybe giving enough credit to the fallibility of your own, you know, draft process of, you know, evaluating prospects. Cause you're, you're, you're honing in on a couple of guys and you know, if they don't hit you're, you're kind of screwed. Cause he gave up a lot. Yeah. Uh, D uh, green Bay, excuse me, green Bay, they go, Jordan Morgan, uh, offensive tackle out of Arizona, late in the first, Edger and Cooper out of Texas A&M at linebacker, uh, and Javon Bullard out of Georgia uh, on day two in the second round. They have uh, ended with, uh, you know, four picks on day two. They also go Marshawn Lloyd, uh, the running back out of USC, and Tyron uh, Hopper, the linebacker out of uh, Missouri in the third. So a couple linebackers, uh, you know, here, but they do have a lot of picks on – on day two, what did you think of their draft? Yeah, I liked their draft fine. I would say like it's a it's a solid B. Uh, I liked getting Jordan Morgan. You know, he gives them some versatility. He can play on a tackle, but he can also scoot inside to guard if they need it. Uh, Edrin Cooper, uh, who you know got a little bit of hype as a potential first rounder, but I mean never really seriously was going to go there. But I think you know decent value in getting him at number forty five. Super athletic, uh, addresses a position of need. Uh, Javon Bullard out of Georgia, the safety. Like, I think he has a decent chance of being able to contribute in his first couple of years. Marshawn Lloyd, uh, I, I think, you know, good running back out of USC and uh, a decent chance that he ends up being their long term number two back. Like, none of it was sexy, but like they, they addressed positions of need without doing anything like incredibly stupid and reaching for players. So, like, yeah, I would say like that's a solid B. 
All right, let's jump to the NFC East. Uh, I know you're uh, partial to the Cowboys. I'm partial to the Giants. That being said, uh, so I, you know, I, I, I looked at this Eagle draft and I'm like, oh man, here we go. This is this is a pretty good draft. Uh, but, but what did you think uh, of the Eagles? You know, they go they double up on corners with their first two picks. Yeah, it's like the Breaking Bad meme of like <laughs> you can't keep getting away with it. Like Quinny and Mitchell, um, there was the the possibility you know floated around uh with eagles beat reporters that the eagles would have to trade up if they wanted to get a player like quinny and mitchell and there was the idea that like he specifically was the guy that they would be targeting in a trade-up scenario uh awesome for them they didn't have to do that they were just able to stay there at number 22 and get him uh and then if you looked at mock drafts uh cooper DeGene was often commonly mocked to uh to the Eagles at number 22 under the idea that Mitchell wouldn't be there uh and then they get Cooper DeGene in the second round uh yeah. and you know so they address the situation of having these two starting cornerbacks of Darius Slay and James Bradbury both over 30 uh you know maybe Mitchell and DeGene can be the long-term successors to them you know maybe DeGene ends up having to play uh you know in the slot or play safety there's some uncertainty about whether he's a, a perimeter corner but either way they two they get two really good players here uh and they do it at a position of need uh without reaching and maybe getting some value while they were doing it and then in the rest of the draft uh, I like getting Aeneas Smith, a Texas A&M wide receiver. He has some potential in the slot. Also, Johnny Wilson, uh, you know, big bodied Florida State wide receiver who like there's some talk that maybe he ends up having to convert to tight end. But, you know, maybe he's a, a big bodied slot. Uh, so, they, you know, they got some potential in those two guys. And then they were able while moving around in the draft. By the way, Howie Roseman set uh, a record, I think, for eight trades uh, in the <laughs> draft while moving around. They were able to pick up uh, picks for next year. So now for next year's draft, they have two thirds, a fourth and two fifths. You know, like they didn't sacrifice much in this draft while also still loading up and giving themselves some flexibility next year. So I would say this was a a solid A for me. Yeah, I really like their draft and in, in Washington, I think. Uh, you know, I mean, they had a lot of picks, and but I think they did a, a pretty decent job with them. What did you think of Washington? Obviously, they start off with, with Jaden Daniels at number two overall, but then they have four more picks, uh, five more, no, yeah, four more, five more picks in the top 100. Uh, so they're able to, you know, go out and get a tight end. They're able to uh, hit their O line, get another wide out, uh, a lot of hit a lot of different needs, I think, for, for Washington. So, what did you think there? Yeah, I liked their draft. Um, I would say that is for me also an a and um yeah Jaden daniels who knows if it should have been him versus drake may i think i leaned more towards Jaden daniels uh but you know time will tell in the second round uh getting jerzon newton uh i think that was really good value there he was a guy who was commonly mocked into the first round um you know there might be some concerns with uh like a potential foot injury uh and that is maybe why he slid but you know i think if as long as that is is that as long as that's fine? Like, I think he should be fine. Now there's a question about like what, whether they actually needed another defensive tackle. Like that's one of the few areas on the team where it's like, you guys are set. Um, but you know, I think it is a position of value there for them. And I do like, uh, them adding him, uh, Mike Sanders still, uh, out of Michigan, uh, decent cornerback there getting him in the second makes sense. Uh, Ben Sinat, uh, super athletic tight end out of Kansas state wasn't really productive, um, but a lot of you know, athletic tight ends entering the league aren't really all that productive. And then they just, you know, become really good players in the NFL. There's a possibility that he could do that and it addresses a position of need. Uh, and he's got some like positional versatility in terms of how they can use him. Uh, like he's been like an H back kind of played fullback some. So like there, there are different things that he can do ways in which he can function in that offense. Um, getting Brandon Coleman out of TCU, uh, he has some guard tackle flexibility. Like they need some offensive line help. They need a left tackle. I don't think Coleman is going to be able to, to fit that for them, but at least they did get some added muscle there. And then I really like Luke McCaffrey. Like I will say if there is one guy who has kind of like Puka Nakua type of potential, like I think it is McCaffrey, like someone who didn't go early uh, in fact, I'd say like McCaffrey went higher than I think a lot of people expected him to, but like he did really well in college as someone who 
was just learning the position. And he does have like Christian McCaffrey, like athleticism, you know? So it's not quite like, Hey, just imagine Christian McCaffrey as a slot receiver, but like it's approaching that. And McCaffrey was a quarterback and then transitioned to wide receiver. So like he has that quarterback mindset and perspective as a route runner. Uh, and so I think there's a pretty decent chance that he ends up having maybe not year one, but like some like Hunter Renfro type of potential in terms of like, Hey, there's this slot receiver. Who's actually like way better than like we would expect him to be. Uh, so McCaffrey, you know, maybe they reached for him at pick 100, but I think he's going to end up being a good player for, for them. So I like what they did overall. And it, like, if you have that many picks in the top 100, it's like seven picks. Uh, yeah. Six picks in the top 100. Like it's hard for your draft to look all that bad. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give them an A. All right. So that's your, that's your Puka Nakua call of this year. McCaffrey mark it down fantasy players. Uh, let's go to, uh, Dallas, uh, they go Tyra Guyton, the offensive tackle out of Oklahoma in the first round. They do trade down. Uh, we pick up another third rounder uh, in that one. Uh, what did you think of Dallas's draft? I didn't hate it. I didn't, I didn't like it, but at least I didn't hate it the way I hated last year's draft, where they drafted a defensive tackle in the first round, a 25-year-old tight end in the second round. Like uh, at, at least they didn't do anything like that. I liked that Tyler Guyton – uh, they traded down uh, and we're still able to get an offensive lineman in round one. And Guyton has some positional versatility. He's either going to be their left tackle or their left guard. Uh, the edge rusher that they got in the second round, Neyland, like I think he will be a perfectly fine rotational edge. And then their Kansas, uh, Kansas State interior offensive lineman that they got in the third round, Cooper Beebe. Like I think he's got a decent chance of slotting in as their center uh, as a rookie. So I feel like they did a pretty decent job of addressing the offensive line uh, in the, the first three rounds. And then uh, they didn't get a running back. Uh, but I, I mean, I guess like on the plus side, at least they didn't overspend on a running back. On the minus side, it means that they signed Ezekiel Elliott. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know which one I would have liked more, but uh, at least they didn't do anything that felt like a drastic mistake. So I would say, like, okay, you know, this is this is a C. This is what a C looks like. And then we have the Giants. They go Malik Neighbors uh, at number six overall, the wide out of LSU. Then they go to try to fix their secondary uh, or, or add to it with uh, Newbin and, and Phillips. And then uh, then they go back to some offensive skill guys with Theo Johnson and, and Tyrone Tracy. What did you think of the Giants draft? This is like another, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a C. I think it's better than a C and that you got Malik Neighbors. I think he really upgrades what they are doing on offense. They needed to get a player like that. And it could have been tempting for them to be like, hey, you know what? Let's take J.J. McCarthy. Like they could have gone that route. I think it was better for them to add a wide receiver here. Uh, and then I do like that they added Theo Johnson, who has a ton of upside and uh, especially with the potential of Darren Waller retiring, the uncertainty there with him, uh, they needed some help with the position. I don't think there was anything overwhelming with what they did at the other spots, but like, I don't think they made any key mistakes. I would say like, this is a B minus. All right, let's jump to the NFC West and let's start with the Niners. You know, they go to the Super Bowl, they start out their draft uh, with Ricky Pearsall uh, late in the first round, the wide out out of Florida, which, you know, that, that creates questions about what's going on with Debo and IU And remember, this is a team that they had an interesting draft last year. I think they'd taken like kickers in the, on, on day two and whatnot. So what did you think of the Niners draft this year? A few more players uh, than they got last year, but I, I don't think you liked it quite as much. Yeah. Can, can we like point out that the 49ers are just like bad at drafting? <laughs> I, I mean, they, they've been bad at drafting for years. And I would say like, if not for, um, if not for Tom Brady being like, Hey, get rid of Jimmy Garoppolo. Uh, the 49ers maybe wouldn't have found their quarterback in the early years. And then if not for randomly landing on Mr. Irrelevant, and I don't want to say like it's random because look, they did the job of scouting him and developing him, but there is a lot of luck in being bailed out by the last pick of a draft when you invested 
two first rounders like to trade up to get a quarterback who did like literally nothing for you. The 49ers, it's like they, it feels like they are a trust fund kid who is just <laughs> like spending money that uh, they did not earn uh, just in terms of the way that they go about drafting. Like positional value means nothing to them. Like big board value means nothing to them. And that is how you get Ricky Pearsall drafted number 31 overall. And this is not, not a knock against Pearsall. He would have been a perfectly fine option in the second round, but like you don't draft him number 31 overall. And I would say there's also just like a, a process in terms of how you do this. Like you took a wide receiver way earlier than you need to at number 31. And then you addressed cornerback in the second round and cornerback was a, a really thin position in this draft wide receiver, a really deep position in this draft. If you know, Hey, we're looking at these two positions. There's a decent chance we take them in the top two. You obviously flip the order of how you do it. You go cornerback in round one wide receiver in round two, and you get yourself overall, uh, two higher quality players. So like, there's just in terms of like knowing how to navigate a board, there is a lack of finesse that is surprising given how long these guys have now been in power with the 49ers. Like you have had years to practice this. You have had years of getting feedback from media asking you questions about, Hey, why did you do this stupid thing? And then by the way, the 49ers do not need a running back. They, they never need to <laughs> right. draft another running back. Okay. And, and of course they drafted a running back in the fourth round. And then, even though they reached for a wide receiver in the first round, they added what I would say is like a redundant wide receiver in the fourth round. So, I mean, I know they probably just stick to their board and they don't really think too much about how to navigate it, like how to play it. But man, if if you are playing a game and you don't think of it as a game, you are already going to lose. So the 49ers... Yeah, I think they got some decent players, but I don't think they really did it in the best way possible. This is like a D plus. Do, do you think it's perhaps because uh, we, you know, we don't know exactly what goes on in their process, but I, I do know teams kind of have some weird processes where sometimes like the head coach will, will kind of get it, get have say on like maybe the first rounder and then kind of, you know, the, the scouts will take over later in the draft of the GM. But, you know, it seems like a lot of the the, the moves you were most critical of, came on the offensive side of the ball. We know, you know, that's Kyle Shanahan kind of running the show. Do you think maybe he's, he's, you know, his strengths are a lot more, you know, on the field, you know, scheme and coaching, and maybe he was too involved in the process of the draft process, or what do you think of how that, how this keeps happening? Yeah. I mean, there's the story of the first year that the 49ers uh, had this new regime in place. There was a running back that wasn't even on their board that Kyle Shanahan put back on their board after a conversation with John Lynch. And then they traded up to get him. And then he did nothing for them. Who is that? Uh, was that William? Well, what's, uh, who is that? Jay? Was that Jay? Willett? No. Who was no, that? I, I can't, I can't remember that guy's name because it's so inconsequential <laughs> because he never did anything in the NFL. And like Shanahan made like, uh, he made a thing of it of like, no, go get me this guy. And by the way, this was after they had just signed Jarek McKinnon in the off season to a massive contract. Like they just have no sense of positional value. And then also, even if like, if you do want to invest in a running back fine, but then you don't need to over invest in it. Right. It's just, it, it screams of like a lack of coordination between different parts of the building. All right, the Rams, uh, they double up on Florida State linemen uh, early in the draft. They go uh, Jared Verse at, at number 19 overall. They get uh, Braden Fisk in the second round. They got Blake Corum out of Michigan in the middle of the third. What did you think of the Rams draft? So, I, like, I'm mixed on it. Like, there were things that I really liked about it. I liked getting Jared Verse 
in the first round. Like if things had gone differently, there was a chance he could have gone, you know, a, a decent amount higher than that. Defenders ended up falling. I think, you know, great value there in getting him at number 19. And you need to do something with your defensive line. You know, they added some guys last year to address it, but obviously losing Aaron Donald, you need to add some more playmakers in the defensive trenches. They did that with verse. And then I liked adding his teammate, like, uh, verse and Fisk, like they played off of each other quite a bit on the defensive line at Florida state. So like adding those two guys already having some continuity there, like, I think it makes sense. And like, generally it kind of fits the draft range for Fisk, but I don't like that they traded up and they traded a lot to get Fisk. And, uh, you know, they did that when maybe they didn't really need to. Um, so, I don't like that they kind of lost their cool. They gave away more than they needed to. Uh, I do like that they added Blake Quorum. So, like, I like the players that they added. I feel like they gave away too much to get Fisk, um, especially when there was a chance he was going to fall to them. But uh, I'd say, like, it's it's a B plus. Like, I like it more than I would, I would like. Um, like, honestly, this should probably be, like, a – this should probably be like a C plus in terms of process, but I like the players they got. So I'm giving it a B plus. Yeah. I feel like the Rams, it's kind of like, I guess they earned a little bit of benefit of the doubt. You know, they've been kind of making some shrewd moves and overperforming expectations. I mean, they go get Stafford a couple years ago, win a Super Bowl last year. I mean, I, I'll come out and say, I thought their defense was going to be horrible and they, they found a way to kind of stay, you know, stay afloat enough to make the playoffs. Uh, you know, they got Puka and then, you know, this off season, who was it? Uh, was it Col- they signed Colby Parkinson, I think. So like they they yeah. make some moves where it's like, what are they doing? But they seem to turn out okay. So I will give the Rams uh, some benefit of the doubt. Uh, I mean, on here's, this draft. here's one way of contextualizing the Fisk move. They traded up for a guy who turns 25 this year. Like, you probably didn't need to do that just so you could draft a 25-year-old high in the second round. Like, yeah. You know, there there are some things that are like, you know what? If I squint, this looks a little bit like the 49ers. <laughs> I mean, hey, the Rams do want to look like that's kind of what the Rams are trying to be, the 49ers. Like they they are in these epic battles all the time. So I, I get it. But yeah, you kind of wonder because I mean two two guys from the same school, you wonder if they maybe, you know, they fell in love, you know, because they were obviously scouting Florida State hard if they fell in love, you know, with, with those guys a little too much. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll see. Uh Seattle, a team that another team I feel like so I feel like Seattle a lot of times you you can kind of criticize their drafts uh you know after the the fact and they tend to look a little better in, in retrospect as well uh they they do get Murphy uh out of Texas to DT at number 16 they go Christian Haynes uh out of Yukon a, a guard in round 2 uh a lot, lot of lot of uh picks for Seattle on this one what do you think yeah, I mean, this was kind of nondescript. I'd I'd give this like a C. Nothing wrong with it at all. I do like getting Byron Murphy. Um, you know, there's a chance that he actually is a different a, a difference making defensive tackle for the front of you know uh, your your new defense there under your head coach Mike McDonald. So like getting him at 16, they didn't reach for him anything like that. I think that's fine. Um, they traded away their second rounder last year to get Leonard Williams on the defensive front as well. So you kind of have to think of him a little bit when you're doing the grade, uh, Christian Haynes. Um, he, you know, fits a need. He might compete to be their right guard this year. So I think that's fine, but like there was nothing, um, other than adding Murphy, like nothing difference making with this draft. Um, but also like nothing that is going to like, you know, raise concerns of like, Hey, you really reach for this player or anything like that. So, you know, I think it's a C. Yeah, I mean, Seattle's another one of those teams, though, kind of like the Saints. I feel like they do usually find – or they're capable of finding, like, all-pro kind of guys outside the first round. So, yeah, uh, another another one where I'll, I'm kind of interested to see, you know, how these guys turn out. I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone pops – you know, it is it is nondescript, but I wouldn't be surprised if somebody pops in those in those middle rounds for Seattle. Uh, the Arizona Cardinals, you know, I I, I kind of struggle with this, with this draft. A lot of picks um, – I think there were some reaches, but I guess you can you can say you can afford to do that with with the amount of picks that they had. Although, you know, as you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, they kind of made some trades last year and maybe maybe they were better off not making. Uh, so they do get Marvin Harrison. I love love that. You already have Kyler Murray, so you can afford to just go wide receiver early in the draft. 
Uh, and then just a lot of picks on on day uh, number two. You know, they go Robinson out of Missouri, the DT. They get uh, they get a corner, uh, a, D, a D back out of Rutgers. They get a they get Trey Benson at running back. They get uh, another tight end, Tim Raymond, uh, who's interesting. Some people felt he was a reach. So a lot, a lot going on here for the Cardinals. What did you like? What didn't you like? By the way, Tip Raymond, if you told me that name, and said, this is the name of a player. What position does he play? Tight end would have obviously been the choice for that name there. That's just like your typical tight end name. But yeah. uh, should have, should have I, paired, the Falcons should have paired him with uh, Penix. <laughs> yes, ab- <laughs> absolutely. Um, I would say that this is a B. Um, like nothing, nothing wrong with this draft. Uh, Marvin Harrison getting him at number four. Uh, I think totally fine pick if it had been a different year, like there's a possibility that he's going number two or number Mm -hmm. three. So I think some good value there. I like Darius Robinson as the second first rounder that they added. He's got positional flexibility and that, you know, he, he played out on the edge this last season, but he started his career as a defensive tackle. So he's got some versatility there. I think that comes in handy when you have a defensive head coach with the scheme that they have. Um, you know, you mentioned Max Melton, the cornerback out of Rutgers, and then they also added uh, in the third round Boston College cornerback Elijah Jones. So double dipping at that position. I think there's the hope that, you know, maybe both of those guys could turn into starters for them. Uh, Trey Benson, I think a really good number two running back. Um, he has. I don't want I wouldn't say like Kenneth Walker type of game, but like he's big and fast like that. And. You know, James Conner, I think, has done, you know, great yeoman's work for the Cardinals the past few seasons, but he's getting older. And I think Trey Benson is a really good number two who might even end up overtaking him as the season progresses. Like he has lead back potential in the NFL and third round. I think that's the fine. It's a fine time to take a player like that. Isaiah Adams, uh, the guard they took out of Illinois, he has a pretty decent chance of being able to start for them within his first season. And then Raymond, he's a reach. Like he's a, a, a kind of like block only type of tight end. You don't need to take that in the third round. Guys like that can be found on day three, but you know, nothing really wrong with a lot of what they did here. And they did add bodies at positions of need in part because they have so many needs on the roster, right. yeah. but at least you did it without uh, any like massive reaches, maybe with the exception of Raymond. So uh, yeah, I would say like, this feels like a B. All right. So that's going to do it. Uh, just kind of to recap, just who is your favorite uh, out of the NFC period? Like your favorite draft, who would you say? Uh, I mean, it's easy to say Chicago because, Hey, you got the number one pick and then, Hey, you had another pick in the top 10. Uh, but so I, I really do like Chicago out of like the non obvious. Um, I'll just still go with Philadelphia, like, like, you know, building all of the draft capital for the future while also getting two of the top, uh, like two of the top five cornerbacks in this class at value while addressing a position of need. I mean, like that's just a home run. All right. Well, that was great stuff, Matthew. And uh, you'll be back with our AFC edition uh, of this pod tomorrow morning. So be sure to check that out. And everyone be sure to check out everything Matthew Friedman is doing uh, over at Fantasy Life. You can follow him on X, formerly Twitter, at Matt F. The Oracle. Matt, thanks again for coming on. And uh, we'll see you next time on the Action Network podcast presented by BetMGM. I'm your host, Chris Raybon. Let's get this money. 